The Game Boy, arguably one of the best video game systems of all time. Some of you may think that I love the Game Boy for its portable nature, which is a common reason cited by many for loving the Game Boy, but I never really enjoyed taking it with me. Playing in a car would make me car sick, and if I was somewhere other than my house, I was probably doing something else. So what exactly made the Game Boy so great for me? The answer is its massive library of games that were absolutely amazing. Sure, I guess I took the Game Boy with me sometimes, but that was more of a novelty. The games themselves helped the system solidify itself in my mind as one of the best of all time. That's why for this top 10 list, I want to go over what I feel are the 10 best. Now for this list, I'm only looking at Game Boy and Game Boy Color games. I always felt like the Game Boy Advance was the next step and the Game Boy Color was like the new 3DS. Exclusive games taking advantage of the new hardware but essentially the same thing as its predecessor. A midpoint of sorts. So, let's go! Sequence start. 10. Kids today got Portable Pit with Kid Icarus Uprising, I had Kid Icarus of Myths and Monsters. This game held true to the original Kid Icarus. The game played sort of like Metroid in that some of the levels were vertical and you had to scroll up to get out. Some levels scrolled horizontally. Then, at the end of each world, you got to a dungeon that I can see people either loving them or hating them. I love them. I draw little maps and it was satisfying knowing that I was making progress by exploring every single room. I can see people hating them because it was pretty easy to get lost. The game did have a map system for the dungeons, but first you'd have to get a torch, the map, and a pencil to be able to truly figure out where you were. To get the map, you'd have to find it within the dungeon, and the torch had to be purchased in the store which was also hidden within the dungeon. Yeah, I think I'll draw my own, thank you very much. Kid Icarus of Myths and Monsters is a must-buy for any 3DS owner who is into retro video games. Nine. Wario Land is like Mario Land, but better. It's almost like math. Just do the math. There it is. There's the facts. Wario Land is what the Game Boy was made for. Compact, massive, and handled well within its limitations. The game was pretty decent in size, with each level having one treasure hidden deep within. Some levels had hidden exits that allowed entrance to other secret levels. And to top it all off, depending on your money and treasure status at the end of the game, you can get multiple endings. Talk about replay value. For a Game Boy game, this is one that got a lot more play than a lot of my console games. Sure, the controls may be a little sluggish by today's standards, but if you're not a picky player, you'd probably like it. Probably. I mean, there's no math to back that up. Eight. Alright, this one's kind of an odd choice, because I'm sure there are a lot of better and more original games than this one. Because, yeah, it's just a Tetris Attack clone. Like, it's literally the exact same thing as Tetris Attack on Super Nintendo. Just look at them. Same game, but with some minor differences. Eh, whatever. This game was one of the games I played the hell out of on my Game Boy. I spent who knows how many hours just sitting there in my dorm room, eyes dried out from the lack of blinking as I challenged the Elite Four on intense difficulty. The thrill of victory and the agony of just one more and then we'll go to dinner. It's a really great game and I think it works best as a Game Boy game rather than a console game. A game like this is nice when it can be enjoyed on a bed, on a couch, on a reading chair, I don't know. Maybe it's just my personal experience clouding my judgment and making me think that this is some kind of amazing game when in reality it's just another puzzle game with a Pokemon theme. But as far as puzzle games go, I choose this one over Tetris. Tetris is intense. I like Tetris. But this is intenser er, er. Also, does this music not sound familiar? right? Seven. What happens when you take a Game Boy Color game, release it in 2002, a year after the Game Boy Advance has been out? You get a game that no one gives a crap about because holy jeez, that looks like the N64 version, holy cow, this is a portable? That was the case of Shantae. Oh, and you also get ridiculously priced copies on eBay. What?! Well, the game's just that awesome. And it didn't help that there aren't many copies available on the street due to the fact that the game was not expected to succeed with the much more powerful GBA hogging all the attention. And what a shame that was because this game is great. Released by WayForward, the guys who brought us that awesome Contra 4 game among some other good titles, Shantae went on to gain a cult following. The game itself is relatively simple and not that revolutionary in terms of actual gameplay. It plays a lot like Metroid or Castlevania 2. You're placed in a large world that you are free to go wherever you want as long as you have the right items or power-ups to make it to said places. Some areas have items that you can't get until you come back later with a stronger power-up. Think handheld side-scrolling Batman Arkham Asylum. The game was good, but nothing mind-blowing in terms of actual gameplay. You can morph into animals, which I guess was pretty creative and unique, I don't know. What was mind-blowing was how much the Game Boy was pushed to the limits. This game looks and sounds better than most NES games, which has roughly the same processing power as the Game Boy. 
they're both, they fit, right? Guys, ah, they're probably not the same, but whatever, you get my point. For a handheld game, this sounded and looked amazing. Throw in some memorable characters, witty dialogue, and a soundtrack that demands a playthrough with your best pair of headphones, and you've got a game that demands $200 from people crazy enough to pay that much. Or if you're like me, you got it on the 3DS Virtual Console for a fraction of that price. Six. What? Pokemon Red at number six? That means gold and silver is higher, right? Nope. Unlike a lot of people, Pokemon started and ended with red for me personally, and I don't see it as that amazing as a game, at least when compared to a lot of the other games on this list. I played through gold and, meh, it was more or less the exact same thing. Okay, maybe it wasn't the exact same thing, it did introduce a lot of new elements that would go on to become standard in the subsequent games, but overall, I didn't feel anything revolutionary about gold and a side stop there. But Red? Holy cow, this game was amazing! It still blows my mind to this day. Music was memorable, the imagery was memorable, the Pokemon were memorable. Yes, I'm one of those guys who absolutely hates the new Pokemon, and yes, I'm well aware that Pokemon Red has a rock with eyes, but there was just something about the old designs that just had grit and inspiration. The new Pokemon seemed too alien-like. The old ones had a level of simplicity that I felt started to fade after Pokemon Gold. Maybe it's just because I lost interest so it seems weird to me, so who knows. But this isn't a video about Pokemon and my dislike of everything post gold. This is a list about the top 10 Game Boy games and I'm pretty much just stalling here. Why? Because what can I say about Pokemon? It's pretty much the Game Boy's killer app. You could get Mario, Zelda, and Metroid games on consoles, but Pokemon was only available on the Game Boy. If you could find a copy of the original Red and Blue, give it a go. Also, I've caught all 150 Pokemon twice. Sorta. Of. You see, what happened was that I was jet set on catching all 150. I had taken my brother's copy of Blue and transferred some of the exclusive Pokemon, his Hitmochan and his Eevee. I would only have to go through Blue again to get the remaining Eevee. I had 149 Pokemon. I'd grinded at the Elite Four for who knows how many hours. I was 40 hours deep into the game, not counting the extra work I put into Blue. All I had left to do was evolve my Dragonair into a Dragonite, and that was it. I was done, a true Pokemon Master. At the time, I only had a Game Boy Advance SP and a Game Boy Color, which I had both at hand to do the whole trading thing. I thought, I know, I'll just trade my Dragonair into the copy of Blue so that it will level up faster through the boosted EXP traded Pokemon gain. To save on time, because 40 plus hours in, suddenly I cared about time, I'll have my red in the Game Boy Color transfer the Dragonair to the blue in my Game Boy Advance SP so that I could just start playing from there. Then I'll trade them back to my red. I plug them all in, turn on the Game Boy Color, it must have had a bad connection, probably due to dust, and the game gets stuck in the boot up screen, simply repeating that familiar bling. I frantically remove the game from the Game Boy Color, put it in the Game Boy Advance SP, and gone. All the information I had was deleted. You know why the back of games say don't turn on and off rapidly? Because this happens. And yes, I started all over again, this time putting in more hours since I now had to beat blue version twice from scratch. And I did it! I eventually caught all 150. That's how much I love this game. Five. Another game that could be considered a killer app for the Game Boy, well, every game after this point could be considered a killer app, Link's Awakening was not just a console port. This was a true and blue original Zelda game. The dungeons are good, the music is good, etc, etc, you've heard it all. I guess if I had to complain about something, it'd be the final boss. Kind of forgettable in my opinion, at least when compared to other Zelda final bosses. But this is a minor nitpick. If you're one of those people who don't consider handhelds to be true consoles, then you've clearly never played this game because it stands up among the best console games ever made. Yeah, it's pretty good. If you own the original black and white version of this game, I highly recommend getting a copy of the deluxe version. Not that big a difference unless you count the optional extra dungeon, but the color just gives it the little extra push to being a great experience. Four. Yup, no one for franchise rule here. I never got the point of those. Is it to keep people guessing? To keep a franchise from dominating the list? Well then it's not really much of a top 10 list if you have to eliminate a better game just because a superior title in the franchise has already made the spot. Anyway, Wario Land 2 took everything Wario Land did and made it better. This is how sequels need to be made. In the same vein, but a whole new experience. You want to make as much money as possible and find all the treasures, one hidden in every level of the game. The greed factor is still in the game at full force. What's different this time around 
is that first, Wario controls so much better than in Wario Land 1, and second, Wario is invincible. In the first game, taking a hit would shrink you Mario style, and then after another meant game over. You could get power-ups, but like the original Mario games, one hit would send you back to your original form. In Wario Land 2, you lose a small number of coins and it sends you bouncing away. You'd think there wouldn't be much challenge, but honestly, the game is just designed so well you don't even notice. It has a decent blend of puzzles and platforming that keeps you constantly engaged to figure out how to move forward and clear each level with the highest number of coins. Power-ups come in the form of hazards such as being lit on fire or eating a donut and becoming fat. These power-ups sometimes allow you to progress in the level, but more often than not, it's to gain access to a decent number of hidden coins, which will help you out in getting to the final level. Like Wario Land, Wario Land 2 is what the Game Boy was made for. Massive amount of levels, great level design, and fun mechanics, and you have a certified classic. See you. What's better than one Zelda game? Two Zelda games! Unless you're out of money, which in that case, this must have sucked a lot. Oracle of Ages and Seasons were released at the same time and both are pretty much the same game, with one focused more on puzzles and the other on action. It pulled a kind of Pokemon Red and Blue-esque marketing gimmick in that you have to link these two games to get a full experience. But whereas Pokemon always felt like a cheap low blow attempting to sucker you out of your money, Oracle of Seasons and Ages pretty much did the exact same thing if not worse. To get the best ending and fight Ganon, you gotta own both games. Beating one game gives you a password which you then type into the next game and by doing so characters in the second quest will remember you, make references to the first game that you beat, and it generally feels like the second half of one story, unlike Pokemon. Considering that Game Boy Color games were like 30 to 40 dollars back in the day, this is one adventure that would have run you quite the heavy entrance fee to get the full experience. But the games themselves were what you come to expect out of the Zelda franchise. Although developed by Capcom, they knew what made a Zelda game great. I personally prefer these games over Link's Awakening simply due to the epic nature of them. It felt massive, it felt grand, I liked the Link feature. Finishing these games back to back is as satisfying as finishing Sonic 3 and Knuckles, one massive adventure that rivals the console Zelda games. How do you take this and stuff it into this? Like this? Metal Gear Solid on the Game Boy Color is a head-scratcher if you haven't played the original MSX titles. Considering that those games were 8-bit, it shouldn't come as a surprise that a Metal Gear Solid game was developed for the Game Boy Color. But this is not the same as the MSX titles. This was an improvement in some aspects. Molded with the Game Boy Color in mind, the game's structure is divided into levels, making play sessions much better suited for the handheld. Everything you'd want in a Metal Gear game is there, except for the voice acting. The coded conversations, although understandably limited, are here. The sneaking, the items, the bosses, it's all here. What's also interesting to note is that this isn't a port of Metal Gear Solid from the PlayStation 1, but rather an alternate take on Metal Gear Solid and serves as a sequel to the original MSX game. In Japan, the game was called Metal Gear Ghost Babel, so I assume it must have been more confusing over there as to where this game fit in the timeline, whereas here we could see it as an alternate universe of the PlayStation 1 game. It's quite impressive that on a console that was used to getting watered down ports like Rampage World Tour, that this one would end up being so good. I would recommend getting this game, but it's gotten a little pricey over the years and there hasn't been a virtual console port. I say keep an eye out on eBay and Craigslist. I'm sure if you watch those sites like a hawk, you can manage to snag a copy for a more reasonable price. Alright, before I get to number one, here are some honorable mentions. Little Mermaid Pinball. Because I like pinball. Funnily enough, I've played Pokemon Pinball and I still prefer this one. Just something about the way the boards are designed, I don't know. Actually, I might prefer Kirby's Pinball Land a little more due to its atmosphere and all. I guess both these games deserve an honorable mention, but Little Mermaid Pinball is actually a pretty good game. So, And the number one Game Boy game is... One. A lot of you saw this one coming because A, you saw that I stuck in Wario Land 1 and 2, and B, this game tends to be in most gamers top 5 Game Boy games. Wario Land 3, and I guess the Wario Land series, is what the Game Boy was made for. Divided levels that allow for easy pick up and play gameplay, bright and easy on the eyes graphic, amazing music, amazing level design. What makes this game better than Wario Land 2 is that they found a way to perfectly use the invincible mechanic to its full potential. In Wario Land 2, the biggest obstacle was the enemies. You didn't want to get hit because you wanted the coins. In Wario Land 3, coins play a much less important role and the game is designed more as a puzzle platformer than an action platformer. Now, the biggest obstacle in getting hit is losing track of what exactly you're supposed to do. Falling may sometimes 
sometimes make you have to start all over from the beginning and figure out exactly what it is you're supposed to do is the real challenge rather than the enemies that are there only to get in the way. Warrior Land 2 didn't focus too much on the puzzle element which I feel works best if your character cannot die. On top of all this, the game is massive. Getting all 100 treasures plus the 8 coins hidden in each level is bound to take up a lot of your time, especially if it's your first time playing through. If you consider yourself a fan of the Game Boy and this game isn't in your collection or 3DS, it's an absolute must. It's a shame Wario Land 4 was nowhere near as imaginative and creative as Wario Land 3 despite being a good game. Wario Land 3, the best Game Boy game ever that most of you probably saw coming. As always, thank you for watching and please share in the comment below which games are on your top 10 list. I'm always looking for new games to challenge my existing list. Thank you for watching and until next time.